All right. Hello, everyone. This is Professor Reardon, uh, Computer Science CPSC 526, Lecture 12 on ARP. So, what is ARP? ARP is a link layer protocol. So if we recall the network stack, we have uh, the link layer at the bottom, the IP layer above it, transport layer above that, and the application layer. So the application layer corresponding to the actual data we're trying to send over the network, data that we're sending over the socket, right? The things that you would receive in your application when you read from a socket or that you would write to a socket. And in order that it gets sent over the internet reliably and in order we use TCP to ensure that, and for two computers in different parts of the internet to actually communicate with each other, we use IP addresses to identify the different computers that may exist on the internet, and the IP protocol is responsible for or bridging that communication. And then whenever two actual pieces of network hardware want to communicate with, with each other, this is done then over the link layer. So when two computers are communicating, they may be spread far across. You have to travel multiple hops in order to get from one place to the other. Your phone is connected to the Wi-Fi, and then that goes to the ISP and out onto the internet, and then it is on the same side on another computer connected via Wi-Fi or something like that to an ultimate computer that your connection goes to. All of these are individual hops, and these hops are being done at the link layer. So whenever two pieces of networking hardware are communicating, when they're able to directly communicate with each other, so they're separate computers, but they're able to directly communicate, say because there's a wire plugged in, or they're both within the same radio range, then the link layer protocol is used, or a link layer protocol is used to actually bridge that communication, to move the data from one computer, from one piece of networking hardware to another piece of networking hardware. And if you do that enough times, you're able to have any computer on the internet communicate with any other computer on the internet uh, using the, the IP uh, layer. So a MAC address is a serial number that is assigned to every single piece of networking hardware. They're called media access control, and it is six octets written in hex and separated by colons. So I have an example there. And it just is basically a serial number that is tied to every single piece of networking hardware. So these serial numbers allow actual hardware to be unique, have a unique number associated with them, and can therefore be used as a way of separating, isolating, recognizing different computers. Now, the reason that the IP addresses or the MAC addresses aren't used instead of IP addresses is that your IP address can and should actually change throughout the day depending on where you actually are. Right? Your phone has a particular MAC address and that MAC address is fixed to the phone. But as your phone is at your home or connected with cell phone towers or is connected at the university, it's going to have different IP addresses during for those different places because the IP addresses are storing somehow some location information, routing information, information that tells how to send traffic to that particular place on the internet. And any networking card can be taken out of a computer and put into another computer somewhere else on the planet, and the IP address should be the same in a sense. It shouldn't necessarily get a new IP address if the, it's the same computer running the same server somewhere. However, the MAC address will have necessarily changed if you actually change the physical hardware that is responsible for doing the networking. Um, one application of MAC addresses that is frequently used is to perform authentication. The idea here is that when you plug in a new computer, somehow it's not able to connect to the internet and you have to talk to someone and tell them what your MAC address is, and then your computer is allowed to access the internet. The reason they're doing this is to perform some sort of authentication. They're basically saying, well, allow these pieces of networking hardware to communicate. You, can pl you can't just plug in any computer on into the wall and get expect to get internet from it. You have to have a MAC address that we've explicitly allowed, is on our allow list of permitted devices onto our network. Now, the idea behind this seems well, well and good. However, the actual practical implications 
interpretation of this is so prone to attacks and is so implicitly vulnerable because MAC addresses are by no means authenticated and they are by no means uh, uh, made to be only that which is the actual serial number of the hardware. Whatever your computer wants to write as the MAC address when it sends it off over the network, your computer is free to do that. There is absolutely no requirement that your computer only sends packets with the MAC address that actually matches the MAC address of the hardware that's sending it out. For the internet to work smoothly, of course, it should. However, in practice, any value can be put there. There's no authenticity. There's no guarantee that whatever is said is the actual physical serial number of a piece of hardware. It's just a number your computer includes when it's sending traffic out over the network. So it seems like a nice idea to have this sort of security with MAC addresses, but in, in practice, it just means that everyone has to do this additional work in order to be able to access the network, whereas an attacker needs only to know what a MAC address that is allowed is in order to communicate or, or make use of the network. And how might someone learn what the MAC address of the computer is? Well, again, security by design. These MAC addresses were never meant to be secrets. They didn't have a security purpose when they were being created. So there's many different ways you can get the MAC address from, from a particular computer. As well, MAC addresses are not in a big random space of numbers. There's a very limited range. They're only six bytes long. And so as a result, anyone uh, you can do a brute force attack to try to guess what a MAC address that is allowed would be. As well, MAC addresses are um, also encode information about the manufacturer themselves. So like different ma to manufacturers of hardware will have different prefixes or different um, uh, basically formats of numbers in the beginning parts of the MAC address that encode information about that manufacturer. And so its number of possible MAC addresses is even smaller when you sort of include the fact that if you know that all of the computers are going to be Dells on a network and they're going to have certain pieces of networking hardware attached to them, you can just know what those bytes would be and only have to guess for the ones that are, are, are truly set to random. Um, if you do want to change your MAC address, you can use a tool called MAC Changer. And it's quite simple to use. You just tell it what new MAC address you want your computer to have, and now that's your new MAC address. And whenever you send traffic out on the internet, it'll be having that MAC address instead of the one that your serial number actually is. And then when you reboot your computer, you, you go back to having your proper MAC address again. Right. So the idea here, just to see this MAC address, it's not this fixed magical value that somehow in, is intrinsic to the network piece of hardware and can never be changed. It's just a number that your computer provides to make the internet work smoothly. And as a result, this self-reporting of MAC addresses means it is not reliable for identification and it is not reliable for authentication. Nevertheless, uh, many, many times it is used for precisely those purposes. Now, at the link layer, individual units that are sent are known as data frames. So now we're talking about sending a packet from one computer to another. These computers can directly communicate with each other and the thing that they're communicating is called data frames. A data frame is not sent to an IP address. The goal of the IP protocol is to eventually route data frames from one source computer to the right destination computer which are identified by IP addresses, but the individual data frames that are sent one hop on the internet, they're targeted to a MAC address. And so when you want to send uh, uh, some information to an IP address, if you know what you want to talk to, for instance, the gateway computer, or you want to talk to um, uh, the router, uh, uh, the router network, machine that's the router of the network, then you might know the IP address of that machine. You may have learned it from the DHCP protocol where you were given an initial configuration. You learned what the DNS servers are and, and the route gateway machines. You're given this information in terms of IP addresses, but now you need to figure out what they are in terms of MAC addresses because a MAC address is going to be the actual serial number that when you want to send information to another computer, that's how you identify it by. 
you know ideally you want to send it to a particular IP address, but the problem is you don't know what computer that is. You're in, connected to a network with a dozen computers, say, and you know you want to talk to one particular IP address. Now you just have to figure out which computer has that IP address. And figuring out which computer has that IP address is precisely the job of the ARP protocol. So here's an example of uh, Ethernet data frame, and you can see at the beginning, at the top, we have six bytes corresponding to the destination MAC address, six bytes corresponding to the source, and then two bytes corresponding to the type of network traffic. So the first six bytes, that's the destination. It's basically saying, I want to talk to this MAC address, and I'm that MAC address. So here we see it's really two computers communicating directly, and they're identified by MAC addresses. And then the last two bytes corresponds to what type of data is being sent. In this case, it's IPv4 traffic. So everything that follows afterwards is now going to be an IP packet, right? And it doesn't need to be. There's other um, uh, protocols that could be there instead of the IP protocol. Now, another thing you'll notice, because this is Wireshark, it somehow translated the MAC addresses. So you can see that this one is Hewlett Packard, one is Dell, right? This is happening because manufacturer information is in fact encoded in the, the octets of the MAC address. So that information is, in, is, is, is somehow fixed or, 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 or not going to be random. It's going to identify a type of manufacturer and then there's the random bytes that correspond to their different pieces of networking hardware that that manufacturer has created. So the ARP protocol. This is the protocol used for address resolution, is known as the address resolution protocol, and it has the purpose of translating IP addresses into MAC addresses. The idea here is quite similar to the DNS protocol. If you recall, that's translating host names into IP addresses. Now, again, we have a similar kind of situation where we have a high level of abstraction and a low level of abstraction and we have a protocol to facilitate the translation across those different layers. So here now we have IP addresses and we want to figure out what actual computer that's on the network uh, owns in a sense that IP address. And again, we've mentioned earlier, your IP address can change and you get different IP addresses if you disconnect and reconnect to the internet, you might get a new IP address. And when you're in a different location or on a different network, you're going to have a different IP address. So as a result, these IP addresses are borrowed for or leased for some amount of time. And during the per process of this leasing, the actual computer that's, in a sense, responsible to listen for information coming for this MAC address or for this IP address, that is going to be an actual computer. That computer has a MAC address and the ARP protocol is therefore used to figure out who is the MAC address to talk to when you want to send traffic to a particular IP address. Now, the ARP protocol is a broadcast protocol. And the reason for that is when you're communicating over the internet, or within, or rather when you're communicating to your local subnet and you want to talk to a particular computer, the point is that you don't know who to actually talk to at that point. This is why you're actually using the ARP protocol in the first place. If you knew that you wanted to talk to a particular computer, you could say, uh, just directly talk to that computer. But the problem is you know you want to talk to the gateway computer, 192.168.0.1. You know you want to talk to that computer, but you don't know what MAC address that computer is. So you can't talk to any specific one. Instead, we use a broadcast protocol. You just basically shout to everyone, tell me who I should be talking to if I want to be talking to this IP address. And then hopefully that IP address is listening to that and can say, ah, you want to be talking to me if you're talking to that IP address. So that's the basic nature of the ARP protocol. Someone says, I have this IP address and I have this MAC address. Can you tell me who has the IP address that I want to talk to? 10.0.0.12 in this example. And then the machine that actually has that IP, the machine that is responsible for that IP will send a reply and basically saying, tell the person who asked that the IP address that they're interested in is my MAC address. And they basically fill in the blanks. So the question is, I have this IP and this MAC, who, what is the MAC for this IP? And then the response has that blank filled in. 
basically repeating the question, so who asked or information about who asked the question and the information of the response, that is the MAC address corresponding to the IP from the question. Now, all machines that hear this information, all machines on this broadcast subnet, all machines that are able to receive this traffic or read this traffic will also cache the result. They'll make a note of it. They'll say, ah, okay, well, if ever I want to talk to this particular machine, now I know who the, what the MAC address is, and I don't need to ask again. I don't need to consume bandwidth. And the idea here is that you wanted to save network bandwidth, especially for broadcast protocols back in the earlier days of the Internet. If you have a broadcast protocol, it's consuming all of the bandwidth at that moment, so you don't want to be wasting all of the communication sending a lot of these ARP requests, sending a lot of these, these noisy broadcast traffic. So if you heard an answer that you might be interested in, you just keep track of it, and then you have that answer so you don't have to ask again later. So here we have an example of a request being sent out. So this uh, Intel uh, network card is broadcasting to the network saying, I'm interested in talking to 192.168.0.101. I don't know what his MAC address. That's what it means when it's all zeros. And can someone please tell me what that answer is? And then someone answers back, oh, yes, that is my machine. Uh, it's this, the MAC address uh, for that IP address is this, and it sends it back to the person who asked. And of course, anyone who was within radio range or is able to listen to this traffic will also update it in their own records as well so that they'll have the up-to-date mapping of MAC addresses. Now, the key observation here from a security standpoint is that there is absolutely no authentication here. That is, anyone can create these ARP messages claiming that their MAC address is, the actual IP, uh, is for this IP address and not the other MAC address. That is, anyone can create these ARP replies to legitimate or even non questions that weren't even asked and have all of the other machines update their entries as a result. And there's no one who's able to check the, that the MAC address or the IP is actually correct. So if I just want to say that I'm this machine, I can put my MAC address as the response to this and thereby claim it as mine. And now I'll be getting all the traffic whenever people are wanting to talk to that machine that wasn't me in the first place. And as well, you don't have to have this idea of a pending query like in DNS. DNS... Uh, entities will not update their DNS records or their DNS cache unless it's in response to an actual query that's been issued. Whereas in the ARP protocol, machines will automatically update it as they're running because they get this information, they'll update their ARP cache. And so this creates a situation where the MAC address that you you update, the, the, if an attacker wants to insert themselves as a uh, into the network, as position their machine as being the same as some particular IP, they can do it by just creating a fake query and response using the ARP protocol, basically pretending to ask and then pretending to answer, and then any other machines will uh, update their information as well. And it is, can be useful to do these ARP attacks because if you're, for instance, not on path, if you are not going to be a computer that processes traffic from Alice to Bob, you can position yourself by, for instance, poisoning the gateway. The gateway is the machine that computers will talk to when they're sending traffic out onto the internet. If you change what an Alice machine thinks is the actual gateway to your own machine, now your own machine is going to be the one that gets all of these traffic going out onto the internet, which then puts you in a good position to do all sorts of other attacks, right? We talked about all sorts of TCP level attacks that are quite hard to do if you're blind or off path. If you're an off-path attacker, then you're confounded by simple things like sequence numbers. But if you're an on-path attacker, that's trivial. You just look and you see the sequence numbers. And what we can do if you're off-path, one of the first steps is to become on-path. And that's why DNS attacks and ARP attacks are useful in that regard, because they allow such an attacker to go from being off to on-path. So the basic principle of this man-in-the-middle attack is that Eve would send uh, fake ARP replies to Alice and Bob. So Eve would tell Alice that Bob's IP is Eve's Mac. 
Eve will tell Bob that Alice's IP is Eve's Mac. And now whenever Alice wants to talk to Bob, she sends the traffic to Eve's computer thinking that's Bob. And similarly, when Bob replies, he sends it to Alice's computer, again, thinking that it's Alice. But in, or just rather, Bob sends it to Al- uh, what he thinks is Alice, but is actually Eve's computer. So Eve has now positioned herself directly between Alice and Bob and is able to thereby listen to all of this traffic. Um, So Eve is now on path and can further mount all sorts of other attacks at this point. Forwarding traffic, monitoring traffic, modifying traffic, deleting traffic. Eve can do a lot of attacks once Eve is on path. Another attack on the ARP protocol is a denial of service attack. So here, Eve could just send a whole lot of bad ARP replies, basically taking machines offline by making the IP addresses correspond to MAC addresses that don't exist, that no one's listening to. So now, whenever Alice wants to talk to a particular machine, the MAC address that Alice uses will just not be listened to by anyone, so no one's going to respond. And in a sense, just takes down the entire network, because now no machine is going to be listening for any traffic. No machine will, everyone who's looking at the network traffic won't see any traffic that belongs to them, because they're looking for traffic with their MAC address. And if it's a different MAC address, that it just gets ignored. As a result, no traffic is getting through, and you've been uh, able to mount a denial of service attack in that regard. So... The thing about ARP spoofing is that it requires local access. It requires, for instance, being situated in a local area network or within radio range. And this is why it is has less of a security characteristics than the DNS system. Um, because for, the, for ARP attacks, these poisoning attacks tend to be much easier to do in practice. You can ex- have unsolicited ARP information get automatically accepted and you can have um, and you can position yourself thereby as uh, a, a, as an on path uh, attacker. However, in order to do that, you actually have to be part of the network. So, ARP messages can't just come from anywhere out on the internet. So, as a result, you're only able to attack those around you, those that you're able to be in the same broadcast range as. Of course, there's plenty of examples of insider threats or something like that. If Alice, Bob, and Eve all work for the same company, then there may be legitimate attacks, or there, there, Eve may have legitimate uh, access to the network and also have motivation incentives to eavesdrop on traffic between Alice and Bob. Um, so just because they are within a trusted network doesn't mean that all actors within it are fully trusted. And as well, there's other situations like shared Wi-Fi or public Wi-Fi where such attacks as well, you can't have sort of access control of the participants within the network. And of course, once you're on path, there's lots of attacks you can do. For instance, TLS stripping attacks. So you can just remove the HTTPS, remove the S from HTTPS, and then trivially monitor the traffic as a result of that. So how can we deal with these ARP attacks? Well, first, we note that it, you have to be within the, the subnet, so you have to be a trusted user. So one example with you when you have um, MAC address-based authentication is a sort of step in this idea, even though that's not a very um, secure system. But the idea being that, well, let's only allow specific computers that we trust onto our network, not just anyone who's able to plug into the wall. So that's one way that we can uh, deal with ARP attacks. But of course, as we saw, we can always just fake the MAC addresses in that regard. Um, Detection can occur. So a machine may notice that someone else is claiming to have their IP, and, and that can trigger some response or some alert that something is going wrong in a network. So these attacks are observable. They are active attacks, right? Someone has to create fake traffic that does contradict with reality. So that can be detected. And as well, there's uh, you could create a system where the ARP table is just statically defined, where, we, right, if we think about 
the ARP protocol, it's in a sense a sort of convenience measure. We don't want to have to memorize or know ahead of time that every MAC address and every IP address, especially as it is evolving IP addresses, can change. But one could imagine that you just create a big table and everyone knows it, and it's just that on this particular network, these are all the machines, these are all their MAC addresses, these are their IP addresses, this list never changes, this you never, as a result, have to worry about um, uh, ARP spoofing attacks. However, the problem there is now you have to create this information, you have to make sure everyone has it, you have to make sure it's up to date, and it's not very usable from a, from a human perspective to have to hand configure the entire ARP table. Right? The usability is why ARP even exists in the first place. It's a convenience protocol that, so that we don't have to uh, have all this information statically defined. It comes at the cost of it not being secure. Anyone can create these ARP messages and thereby take down or take over for any machine on the network.